This afternoon I'm going to talk about um, decision analysis, essentially how to pick uh, targets for uh, environmental policy. <coughs> and this always sits in an awkward place uh, in the lecture sequence uh, because a lot of the things I'm going to say will become much more clear if I have done uh, evaluation the next three weeks and if I've done policy instruments the three weeks after. Uh, but by the same token, evaluation is much clearer and policy instrument choice is much clearer if I have done uh, target setting first, right? So it's a bit circular. Um, following the book, actually following most books, I'm going to do uh, this bit uh, first. But yeah, there will be forward uh, references. Uh, the lecture you're going to uh, about to see is uh, sort of the first hour uh, in mine and then uh, the last half hour or so is George's uh, and hopefully I'll get through that uh, without too much damage to myself or to you. Um, but that follows from the fact that all of a sudden we have to do uh, longer lectures, right? These used to be lecture series of one hour plus one hour of seminars and now all of a sudden we have to do two hours. Um, I was reading through the comments that people have given to the NSS last year and one of the things that your predecessors complained about was that the lectures were too long and the seminars too short and in its wisdom the university has decided to make the lectures longer, right? Um, was sometimes I can't quite follow uh, what our dear leaders uh, are up to. Um, same is true for the academic advisor program, that one of the complaints that students raised was that you don't see enough uh, of the academics as your academic advisors, and because of that we have abolished the role of academic advisor, and we now have admin people who do the academic advising who can tell you the rules but can't tell you should I follow this lecture or should I follow that lecture? Is that master's any good? Uh, are these people nice to work for, right? They simply don't know the answer uh, to that question. Um, anyway, uh, that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about uh, how to make, uh, how to pick a target. <coughs> I'm going to start with a quote by, um, if I pull up this thing, I probably don't have to look uh, behind me. Um, by uh, Robert Solo, right, the Nobel uh, laureate, uh, famous for his work on economic growth. Uh, economists have the reputation of being unimaginative bean counters, doggedly claiming to quantify the unquantifiable and personifying Oscar Wilde's definition of a cynic as someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. It is true that they, that is the economists, would give a lot for a rough quantitative answer, but it only reflects the fact that any policy can be pushed harder or less hard, further or less far, and that a useful evaluation has to suggest how hard and how far. The beans have to be counted, if only approximately. <laughs> so far, uh, so uncontroversial, right? And then Solo continues, those gentle souls who merely ooh and ah over them are argu arguably part of the problem, not part of the solution. Now, <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln said essentially the same thing, uh, but more succinctly. The true rule in determining to embrace or reject anything is not whether it have any evil in it, but whether it have more of evil than of good. Uh, and Johan Cruyff, one of my heroes, uh, phrased it even more succinctly that every upside has its downside. Um, and that is what we're going to do. We're going to look at those trade-offs, right? Uh, and based on those trade-offs, we're going to make uh, a decision. Um, <coughs> Mostly I'm going to talk about um, pollution problems. Uh, pollution is an externality. Just to remind you of the definition, it's an unintended consequence of somebody's production or consumption and somebody else's uh, production or consumption or utility. Right? Unintended and uncompensated. Uh, um, and pollution comes in many shapes and forms. It can be transported in the environment, can be uh, transformed in the environment, it can disappear into the environment, it can simply be taken up, I'll be talking about some of these things. Uh, it of course also depends, but the effect of pollution also depends on how much pollution is there uh, already. Um, 
which is sometimes enhances uh, things and sometimes uh, it's the exact opposite, right? I mean, noise is annoying, but if there is a lot of noise already, then you coming along and making a little bit of extra noise does not harm anybody, right? Uh, whereas if you were the only one to emit CO2 emissions, we would not have a cl uh, we would not have a climate problem, right? What matters there is that there's so much CO2 already in the atmosphere. That is what makes the problem. Um, so that can go either way. Uh, and the thing that uh, I'll be talking about at greater length uh, today is that sometimes pollution comes as a flow, and sometimes pollution is a stock. And a good example of a flow pollutant is noise. As soon as the activity that generate the noise ends, the pollution is gone, right? The annoyance is gone. Whereas uh, with a stock pollutant, the activity can end, but the effects can linger. And the canonical example of that is nuclear waste. Yeah. Some nuclear waste will be with us for another 10,000 years. If we stop all nuclear power production today, then the nuclear waste problem will still be here in 10,000 years. <coughs> right? So that is a stock pollutant. And that has effects for um, how you set targets and how you look at the problem. <coughs> so I'm going to start with the simplest uh, of problems and kind of find the optimal or the efficient flow uh, pollution. So we are interested in uh, the damages of pollution. That's D is a function of M, where M stands for pollution, and D stands for damages. Uh, we also have benefits of the polluting activity. Uh, that's B, and that's also a function of M. Why do there have to be benefits of the polluting activity? Well, if an activity does not bring benefit to anybody, anywhere, at any time, then why would we do it, right? So there has to be some sort of reason to pollute. Um, and the net benefits are defined as the benefits minus the damages. And if you want to find the optimal pollution, then we simply want to maximize the net benefit um, by choosing M, so D, net benefit, uh, the first partial derivative of net benefits to the thing we decide on, that's pollution M, the N, uh, D and B, the M uh, must equal zero, that's the first order condition, that is uh, D B, the M minus D, D, the M must equal zero, or the marginal benefits must equal the marginal costs, right? This is simply the equimarginal uh, principle or the first order condition of optimality. <coughs> so that is if we do it uh, uh, algebraically, if we, do, we do it with calculus, we can also do it graphically. Uh, so we have some sort of uh, private, uh, so on, on the horizontal axis, we're looking at emissions, on the vertical axis, we're looking at some indication of uh, the benefits or disbenefit we derive from this. Uh, <coughs> and this is just the total uh, private gains from emissions, right? And what you see is that at a certain point, you stop emitting. You stop making noise because why would you make more noise, right? Uh, you can buy uh, a, a motorcycle with ever heavier uh, engine that makes ever more noise. But at some point, you just have such a powerful motorcycle that it's just not much fun to drive it anymore. Uh, or you're running out of money to buy a bigger motorcycle, right? And you're happy with the one you have. You can't make more noise at a certain point. It's simply there is no benefit of having a more powerful engine. Uh, and at that point, your enjoyment of riding a powerful motorcycle simply does not weigh up against the costs of having a more expensive motorcycle, right? Um, so at some point your private gains start falling and that is the point where you stop making more noise, right? Um, so that is the total. Uh, the marginal is simply the first partial derivative of this. It's the slope of this curve and lo and behold, the optimum is where the marginal equals uh, zero, right? So Q prime is where the marginal private gains from uh, making noise are equal to zero, and that is the point where unregulated, that is the amount of noise you would make, right? Um, 
Now, there's social losses uh, from uh, making noise. You're annoying your neighbors uh, by making so much noise. Um, and they are given in this green curve here, right? <coughs> and the assumption here is there's no noise, there's no damage done, and the more noise you make, the worse the damage uh, gets. And uh, you can uh, add these two functions, and there we have our net gains from uh, making noise. That's the red curve, right? And then the question is, where is the optimum uh, of this? That is uh, in one of two points. One is where your marginal net social gains are zero. Uh, that is where the red curve goes flat. That is one way of doing it. Uh, but that turns out because that is the, those net gains are just the sum of the other two curves. That is equal to uh, the point where the marginal social losses from emissions equal the marginal private gains uh, from emissions. Right. Uh, so that is the point uh, that you see there. Um, and I did away with the red curves, make things a little bit bigger. So unregulated, if there were no externality and no policy in place, what you would do is make the amount of noise that is Q prime. Uh, but if you find the social optimum, that is where the marginal uh, benefits equal the marginal costs, is the amount Q uh, asterisk or Q star. This is much easier to say. Right? So this is simple uh, optimization. <coughs> so we can put a, a little bit of structure uh, on this. As I said, Q prime is the level of economic activity that maximizes private benefits. And Q star is the level of economic activity that maximizes the social benefits, right? That's the difference between the two. Uh, and then the areas that we're looking at uh, have the following uh, interpretation. B is the area under the marginal damage curve. So Q star is the amount of noise we generate. And then B is the amount of damage generated by this noise, right? If the area under this curve, this is the total, um, the total damage that is done. Um, in the optimum, right? Uh, the total damage that is done uh, uncontrolled is B plus C plus D. Uh, that's the total. Uh, damage that we've done, and that makes the area C plus D uh, the total damage that is done by making noise that is unwarranted, that would happen in an unregulated case, that is the excess damage that is done, right? Clear? Um, the area uh, a is our consumer uh, surplus, right? So that's the, uh, or the social surplus, perhaps I should say. So the area A plus B is the private benefit, right? In the optimum. Uh, but B is damage to the environment. Uh, so A is the social uh, surplus that is generated. Um, <coughs> the area C that you're looking at, that is essentially, it's a benefit to the one who's making the noise, but it's a benefit that is uh, above and beyond the social optimum. So that is an unwarranted uh, benefit, right? Um, so that is how you can think uh, of this graph. The uh, intriguing thing about this benefit cost uh, diagram is that the uh, optimal <coughs> amount Q star lies somewhere in the middle. Optimal pollution is greater than zero. Um, and this is something that economists would often say. Um, and if you say this to non-economists, they tend to get terribly upset with you. Right? Because if you do a cost-benefit analysis, then what you find is that there should be pollution. Right? 
right? Um, whereas the uh, intuition of most people who are not trained in economics, they would tell you that pollution should be zero, right? Uh, but that is not what we find. Um, why is that? Well, I started by saying, well, if there's no reason to pollute, then we would not pollute in the first place, right? So there must be somebody who derives a benefit from this activity. Otherwise, it would not have happened, right? Um, so that is the social reason. Somebody uh, is gaining from this. Uh, but there's also a physical reason, and that <coughs> is that the laws of physics and the laws of thermodynamics and the laws of chemistry and biology uh, imply that if you want to go to zero pollution, and essentially you need to go to zero economic activity. It's very hard to imagine anything that we can do that not in some way or other causes damage to the environment. Um, unless, of course, there's thresholds, um, and one of those thresholds uh, may be uh, assimilative uh, capacity, it may be that really you're only starting to annoy your neighbors if you go above 20 decibels right it may just be because your motorcycle is on the road they are up uh, in their bedroom they have a uh, window so if it's below 20 decibels then they simply can't hear you or perhaps they just sleep through anything that is below 20 decibels and then the first bit of damage, uh, the first bit of noise that you make does no damage whatsoever. And that marginal uh, social da that, that, that uh, damage cost curve actually shifts uh, to the right. And you can argue that a little bit of pollution or a little bit of noise does no damage. And then this is the shape. And the, the, the implication of this is not that we would drive noise to the point of uh, exhaustion of assimilation. No, we would actually the optimum shift from here to here, right? We would actually do more damage. We do, or no, we do not do more damage. We actually allow more emissions. We allow more noise, right? Um, so. Optimal pollution is greater than zero, the laws of thermodynamics imply that it must. Optimal pollution is also greater than the assimilative uh, capacity. Uh, and this is because, as I said, somebody somewhere derives a benefit from the polluting activity. Okay? Basic principles of flow pollution. Now let's move to stock pollution. Uh, <coughs> so uh, we still have that the damages of pollution are uh, function d uh, and now they're uh, not dependent on emissions m but on a so far mysterious variable a right that's the difference between the slide that you previously saw now it depends on a rather than on m the benefits of the pollution activity still depend on the uh, emissions m so b is still a function of m a is the stock of pollutants and for simplicity I assume that the stock of uh, pollution, uh, pollution is follows a first order difference equation right and you see that displayed here uh, uh, a difference equation is simply an equation where in this case a at time t depends on its what happened in the previous period t minus 1, so a t is a function of a t minus 1, that's a difference equation, right? And it's a first order difference equation because it only depends on t minus 1. The second order difference equation, it will depend on t minus 1 and t minus 2, right? And an nth order difference equation, you can imagine what is going on. Uh, and this is a linear equation because the equation that you see there is linear, right? It's a linear combination of emissions in the previous period and the stock in the previous period and there is uh, some environmental degradation going on it's not that the stuff stays in say the water uh, forever but it dissipates it disappears into uh, sediment or it's eaten by plants or whatever right the pollution that you put in the river gradually disappears over time <coughs> 
And so now we have a dynamic problem. So we're no longer interested in maximizing um, the uh, net benefits or the net current benefits, that is Bn minus Ba. No, we're interested in maximizing the net present value of the benefits, right? Um, and that is defined, uh, as you see here, following uh, Samuelson, as the current benefits, Bm minus Ba, over the one plus the discount rate rho uh, raised to the power t, right? So that's your standard discounting function. Uh, and now we want to maximize that particular thing. <coughs> We still choose our emission levels because we cannot choose our stock levels. We can only choose our emissions. Uh, so we're interested in the first part of the derivative of benefits to our uh, emissions, the B, the M. Uh, and that is a bit of a beast, right? Um, so what do we have? We want to take, we want to know how B changes, if we change M a little bit. But D, B does not depend. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is just the same expression as we had before, right? Uh, and then on the other side of the equation, we have the D, D, M, right? We want to know how our damages change if we change our emissions a little bit. Uh, but our D this does not depend on M. But our A does, right? D depends on A and A depends on M, so we use the chain rule. So we have the D, the A, the A, the M, right? Go ahead. What does the T plus S mean? I was gonna get there. <laughs> um, and then we have this whole bunch of uh, indices uh, and a discount uh, factor that also depends on something complicated, right? Uh, but this is intuitive, right? So D does not depend on A directly, but it does so indirectly. So what we see here is how does damage change if the stock of pollutants changes a little bit. And this is how does the stock change if our emissions change a little bit, right? Now the decision we are making is about what should our emissions be at time t? So that is why we have an mt here. But that changes the concentration or the stock of pollutants the year after, and the year after that, and the year after that, right? Because we put the stuff in the water and it stays in the water for a very long time, right? Uh, so we start counting at s is 1, because everything happens with a one year delay, right? Because A, T depends on MT minus one, not on MT. Uh, so that we start counting it as is one. Um, very interested in what does this do? <coughs> so this expression, we start at T plus one. How does our concentration change? If we change emissions in the year before. And then this is how much does our damages change if the concentration or the stock changes um, in that particular year. But that is not the only thing that we do because if we emit at time t, then we also change the stock in year t plus two, uh, and in year t plus three, and in year t plus whatever, right? So that is why there is a summation sign here from s is one to whenever. But those things occur in the future, right? Things happen with a delay. So we need to discount that. So in the first year we have no effect, in the second year we have changed the stock, so we do have an effect. So we should discount that with 1 over 1 plus rho to the power. Uh, there should not be a t plus here, or there should be a 1 plus rho uh, to the power t there. Uh, so this should just be an s. Right? Uh, so we change things. In the year after, we should discount that. We should change things in the year uh, after that. We should discount that with 1 plus rho to the power 2, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, apologies uh, for 
debt. Um, <clears throat> that error carries over to the next page. Um, so, what did I do? Well, I changed uh, this expression here. So, what do we know from a first order uh, difference equation? That if you put stuff in the atmosphere now, if you put 100 m into the atmosphere, or in the water I was talking about, if you put 100 m in the water today, then next year the concentration will be 100 higher if say 10% disappears, so delta is 0.1, so 1 minus delta is 0.9, then next year we have 90, or no, next, we put it in this year, 100, so next year we have 100, then in year 2 we have 90, in year 3 we have 81, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, that's how the 1 minus delta works. Um, <coughs> So we actually know what this first partial derivative is. That is simply one plus uh, delta. Uh, it's all the way there. Uh, one plus delta to the power s, right? Uh, not to the power t plus. Um, so we essentially have two discounting, two discount factors going on. One plus rho and 1 plus delta, right? And approximately, if you discount double, then essentially you can add up discount rates. And you can do that exactly if you work in continuous time, and you can do it approximately if you work in discrete time. Uh, so that expression that you see at the top is roughly equal to uh, 1 plus delta plus rho to the power s, not to the power t plus s. <coughs> right, still with me? Um, now let's look at things in the steady state, just to make the mathematics a bit more palatable. Uh, what does a steady state mean? A steady state means that things don't change, uh, which means that you can drop the subscripts, right? So rather than having a t for every t, we simply have a's, right? Things don't change, um, which implies that our first order partial difference equation goes from at is 1 minus delta times at minus 1 plus mt minus 1 you just throw away the subscripts and we have a is 1 minus delta a plus m or a is m over delta right so the uh, notation is a lot simpler uh, in the steady state <coughs> That also means that because your D doesn't change and your A doesn't change anymore, we can take that out of the summation, right? Because this is just a constant. So we have the B, the M, the D, D, the A times this awkward uh, double discounting factor where we now have dropped the T. Uh, very good. Um, and of course, you know how to solve uh, this. This is just. Uh, the expression for the uh, summation. Uh, so what we have is that the B, the M is the D, the A times the net present uh, correction for the net present value, right? And then of course we know what the D, the A is because we just had that steady state equation. So the D, the A is the M, uh, the D, the M times delta, <coughs> right? Now, this is a long story, but essentially the condition is the same, right? What we have is that the marginal benefits, the B, the M, should equal the marginal damages corrected for the fact that it's a stream of damages. It's the net present value of all the marginal damages in the future and on the assumptions of steady state uh, and so on and so forth uh, that is a very simple expression so we simply inflate the marginal uh, benefits by the fact essentially it's it's uh, we turn it into an annuity and then we calculate the value of that annuity today right that is essentially what i've just done conceptually nothing has changed right Marginal costs should equal marginal benefits. 
but the benefits are now a stream of marginal benefits into the future rather than just the marginal benefit in this instance right um, <coughs> so that is how to interpret this so it's still an equimarginal principle but you should simply realize that it's now a net present value rather than just a present value um, <coughs> or it's a discounted uh, sum of future values uh, to today <coughs> Now, I could of course make the example more complicated by now having sort of a stock variable on the uh, on the side uh, of the uh, the the the, the uh, pollution generating activity as well, right? So I gave you the example of a motorcycle. You don't buy a motorcycle to drive today, and then it disappears right no those things last so i could sort of argue that there's spillover costs as well there and that should be a net present value uh, and so on and so forth i could show you that and that just means that we have summation signs on both sides of the equation and the uh, first partial derivatives look even uh, more complicated doesn't change the principles at all right if it's a flow pollutant, it's simply marginal cost equal marginal benefits. If it's a stock pollution, pollutant, then it's marginal cost equal marginal benefits, but now in its net present uh, incarnation rather than um, at a particular point in time. Right? And the uh, important thing to note here is that the decay rate of pollution in uh, the water, is the example I was giving, acts as a discount rate. So what is a discount rate? A discount rate essentially tells you that you count future values less than you count today's values because money is worth less or because you've grown richer or something like that and therefore you discount the future. So that is one reason why you pay less attention to future damages than to today's damages but if the bad stuff if the contamination if the pollution that you put into the environment dissipates over time that also means that you have to care less about it right if you put a hundred in the water today you have a hundred extra tomorrow but only uh, 90 in the year thereafter, then you have to worry less about the year thereafter than you have to worry about next year, right? And you don't need to care at all about what's going on in a hundred years' time because it will have almost completely dissipated. So it acts as a discount, the degradation in the atmosphere acts the same way as a discount rate in the sense that you have to care less about that future. Go ahead. It's not a P, it's a row and it's the discount rate um, right okay <laughs> so this is what economic theory says we should be doing right uh, we should pick um, an optimal level of pollution um, it is of course only one way of doing so and in the first week I talked about the different ethical systems and that this reflect the utilitarian ethic ethic um, and so on and so forth and that is a reason not to uh, do this uh, there's a practical problem and that's what we will be talking about the next three weeks is that somehow <coughs> you need to find this green curve right you need to know how much damage is done and one thing I'm also doing that I did not talk about is that the brown curve and the green curve has to be equal to each other and you can only equate two things if they are measured in the same units you cannot equate apples to oranges you can only equate apples to apples so everything has to be expressed in apples <coughs> and I somehow assumed that the marginal benefits of making noise are measured in the same units as the marginal damages done by this noise. <coughs> that is an assumption I made and that just came from thin air, right? 
essentially. Um, I'll be talking about it uh, at greater length uh, than you may care about. Um, how to do that? Um, so, what have people done uh, instead? If you can't do your uh, cost-benefit analysis, if you can't find the uh, optimum. Um, actually, the most common way of setting standards is essentially that we pick an arbitrary standard. That there is jostling in the House of Commons about what the target should be, and then at the end of the day, it is by a majority vote that this target is set. And most parliamentarians who vote have never read the primary legislation, so they're just doing what the whip tells them to. Um, or they may be, uh, and that, that would happen in the House of Commons here, if you go to uh, uh, the US, then there is a lot of horse trading or pork barrel politics going on that I will vote for your bill if that bill specifies that you build a library in my district, right? Uh, and really those uh, people are voting not for the environmental standard, but they are voting for having a library uh, in their district, right? Um, and I'm not kidding you, you should actually, just for your education, read these bills that go through uh, the hill uh, in the US, they actually specify in Article 356, uh, Clause 7, that a library shall be built in Greensboro, Illinois, right? That is what's literally in the legislation uh, in the US, and that's what people vote for. Um, and the upshot of this is that the targets that are being set essentially have very little to do with either the cost <coughs> of meeting those targets or the benefits of meeting those targets, right? That is basically uh, what primary, primary uh, target setting uh, is uh, about. <coughs> it's uh, political horse trading, there's power plays going on. <coughs> um, alternative ways of justifying uh, targets uh, are uh, listed uh, here. Um, at the moment, um, there's a lot of noise in the environmental movement about ci citizen uh, juries, and perhaps about referendums. Um, citizens' juries essentially you pick a random but representative sample of people, you put them in a room, and you let them decide what policy should be. Right. It's a sort of a, a simple form, a simpler form of di and a, a less costly form of direct uh, democracy. Rather than having our parliamer parliamentarians fight it out, we have a group of citizens uh, fight it out. Um, the answer would be just as arbitrary, but perhaps it's easier to justify that this is the decision uh, that has been made. Uh, you can also ask everybody in a referendum. Uh, the problem, as we know all too well in this country, uh, is that referendums may be good for simple questions, but they're not so good for difficult questions, and they're not so good for what we see with Brexit, where we have a simple alternative, saying in the EU, or an un against an unspecified alternative going out without having told anybody that there's a million ways of leaving the EU and nobody quite knew what the consequences would be still nobody knows what the consequences <coughs> I hope would be rather than will be right um, but it sort of has this veneer of the will of the people or rather uh, the will of the people who can lie the hardest, uh, of the will of the politicians who can lie the hardest to the people, right? Um, <coughs> Sometimes we set environmental standards by referring to safe minimum standards. We sort of say, well, this is a bad thing, we don't want it to happen, and therefore we're just going to exclude it, right? 
And this is the way we set targets for food and for um, for medicine, right? That essentially, if you buy something in the shop, then that has been tested, and it has been tested against some sort of standard, and if too many people are projected to fall ill, if there's this particular uh, substance in your water, then we simply ban it, right? The sort of the, the, the thinking behind this is that the benefits are infinitely large and the costs are negligibly small, right? That is the case of cost-benefit analysis which suggests that that is what you want to do. Um, and if we are talking, say, about <coughs> carcinogenic material in food, in some sort of, if we find out that one additive to uh, food is carcinogenic, it gives people cancer, and there is an alternative on the market, an alternative food additive that is just as cheap and just as good and just as tasty and uh, just as good at preserving your uh, food or making it a nice color, then it would be absolutely silly not to switch to the alternative, right? So you can just ban it and you can ban it without imposing uh, much of a cost on anybody and you create a benefit in the sense that you're not causing cancer. So this is a perfectly legitimate um, way of setting uh, time. There's still a lot of arbitrariness in that because how do we, s how do we determine what is a safe minimum? <coughs> well, if it comes to uh, food uh, in particular, the way we do it is we feed it to rats. And if we feed a particular substance to a thousand rats and only five of those rats die, then that is deemed safe. So that's half a percent. And then we <coughs> divide it by 10 and that is the amount that we allow in our food. And then the assumption is because we are a hundred times as big as the average rat and only half a percent of rats die and we divided the number by 10, then we're sort of at a factor of, uh, what is it, 0.005%, right? And that is deemed safe. Why is that safe, right? Why is it 0 0.005, 0 0.005 rather than 0.004 or 0 0.005, right? There is, it sort of sounds like an acceptable thing to do. It's essentially an arbitrary number, right? It's just that we displace the arbitrariness to a number that is hidden uh, from uh, view. <coughs> of course, the assumption is also that the laboratory tests were done uh, to the appropriate standard, uh, which is not necessarily the case. The assumption is that rats are a good model for human, uh, rat metabolism is a good model for human metabolism, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of why rat, not mice, right? Um, there is a lot of arbitrariness that goes into what is seemingly uh, a scientifically objective uh, stand. Uh, an another way of setting targets is to simply do the best we can, pick the best available technology, um, and say, well, we can't uh, avoid damage to the environment, but we can simply solve it to the best of our ability, and therefore we're going to prescribe a certain type of engine uh, or a certain type of insulation uh, in your house uh, and that's how we set the target. We simply are doing the best that we can. And uh, the problem with this is, if, say we're talking about insulation of houses and if you ask an engineer to build the most uh, energy efficient house, they go to town, right? You can always improve the engineering standard by not prescribing double blazing, 
got prescribed in triple glazing, uh, which is actually the standard already in Scandinavia and Germany and the Netherlands and that sort of places. In uh, the UK, double glazing is still uh, the standard, uh, but you can also go for quadruple glazing. And you can put one layer of insulation uh, in between your walls, but you could also say you should also have insulation on the inside of the house and the outside of the house, right? You can keep on adding insulation and that's available technology. So if we say best available technology, we are simply doing the best we can. Immediately follows, because if you let engineers do the best they can, they're not going to look at cost and they're going to do the best they can and they're greatly enjoying themselves uh, in doing so you immediately add a clause that it should not be too expensive. So the clause that we that you get is really best available to the technology not exceeding excessive costs. And then you're back to essentially an arbitrary standard, right? Where in the UK we have deemed that new houses should have double glazing, whereas in Germany they have deemed that new houses should have triple glazing. Why double? Why triple? <coughs> Climate isn't that different uh, in Germany uh, than it is here. Uh, some parts of Germany it is, but in the Netherlands it's also triple glazing and that has a maritime climate, not as uh, the UK does. Uh, <coughs> or, uh, and that is um, the uh, final thing I want to say about this, uh, you can lean on the proportionary principle. Problem with that is that there's two proportionary principles and um, one is uh, standard risk aversion uh, better safe than sorry essentially you say well if we are uncertain about the impacts of a particular activity on the environment or on health or uh, on nature uh, then we should try and avoid doing it right yeah, essentially risk aversion we are uncertain and therefore we should be cautious um, doesn't actually set a standard, right? Um, it just means that you're, instead of calculating your best guesses of the costs and the benefits, you have some sort of risk adjusted version of your costs and benefits. Uh, and depending on whether the uncertainty is more heavy on the benefit side than on the cost side, it can skew your uh, decision either way. Uh, so that is one interpretation of the proportionary principle, doesn't get you away from anything. The other interpretation of the proportionary principle is that uncertainty is no excuse. What you often see in environmental debates is that somebody says we should do, we should reduce our emissions because we are terribly worried about climate change. And then somebody else will say, yeah, 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 but we know with great certainty that that would make uh, energy more expensive and would make food more expensive and that will hurt particularly poor people. Whereas the benefits of emission reduction are all very vague, they happen in a few in a distant future, we are not quite certain how the climate system works and so on and so forth. We are uncertain about the benefits and we should really wait for additional research before we do something. Um, now, that interpretation of the prin uh, precautionary principle says that uncertainty is no excuse. The fact that you don't know what this, the outcome will be for certain is no reason not to do it, right? Um, if you decide to go and study economics, right, you don't know what the benefits of that will be because the time that you decide to go study uh, economics, you haven't studied economics yet, so you don't know what it's like, right? Or if you decide to pick this particular module, you don't know what it's like. So uncertainty is no excuse, right? We always make decisions without knowing what <coughs> would be the consequences of those, de those decisions. And if you would sort of have the argument that I don't know what's going to happen if I get out of bed, therefore I'm going to stay in bed, then you'll never get anything done, right? We always make decisions uh, like this. So <coughs> the fact that something is uncertain is absolutely no reason uh, not to do it. And that goes for small decisions like getting out of bed uh, in the morning. It also goes for monumental decisions 
like picking a study or deciding to get married to somebody. Hopefully you know who you're getting married to at that particular time, but predicting what somebody will be like in 10 years time is very, very difficult, right? So you don't know what you're getting into when you get married. And that's absolutely no reason not to do it, right? Um, so uncertainty really is no excuse for inaction, right? Absolutely not. Um, <coughs> now, the, um, but I, I, I suggest that as you set targets through cost-benefit analysis, and we gave you some alternatives, uh, there are alternative uh, project evaluation tools or methods other than cost-benefit analysis, and there are list two here. One is cost-effectiveness analysis. Cost-effectiveness analysis is essentially a special case for cost-benefit analysis. What you do in cost-effectiveness analysis is you meet a target at the lowest possible cost. So what you do in cost-benefit analysis is that you try and find the optimal target. In cost-effectiveness analysis you accept the target, given through maybe arbitrary, it may be decided in a referendum, and then you say, well, this is our goal, how do we get there without incurring too much cost? How do we get there incurring the lowest <coughs> cost possible? Right? That is cost-effectiveness analysis. There is no way of setting targets. It's just a way of uh, organizing uh, how you reach uh, that target. <coughs> and then there's multi-criteria analysis. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, next week. Um, where essentially you say, well, we don't want to maximize the net benefits in a single dimension, but our project has multiple dimensions. There's damage to the environment, there's costs uh, to our industry, there's the distribution of costs over the, the people we care about, and we're going to take all those attributes with us and try to find an optimum not in our unidimensional space but in a multi-dimensional space and we're maximizing over multiple criteria or and i'll make that uh, more explicit next week that is what multi-criteria analysis pretends to do but there is actually no escape from translating everything into a single dimension and um, Multi-criteria analysis is just uh, cost-benefit analysis by a different name if you view it uh, that way. Okay, <coughs> so so much for the theory of all this. How would we do this? Um, now, what can you do uh, in practice? How does these? How do these things work? And I'm gonna briefly discuss a few examples and then we're going to at more length uh, discuss uh, one particular example namely the sewers of London um, so What do you do? So social cost benefit analysis is an analytical tool to inform decisions about interventions involving uh, public expenditure over time, right? So uh, what you do if you're going to apply this, uh, you need some sort of systematic way of counting and uh, valuing uh, all the relevant costs and benefits to society as a whole. <coughs> and then what you do is you can do two things. You can look at a single project and then you say this is a good project if the benefits exceed the costs. So B is greater than C. Or uh, it's the same thing, if the co benefit cost ratio B over C is greater than one, right? And that's the same thing. Uh, so that is what you do if you have a single project that you're looking at. Is it a good thing, yes or no? Uh, and if you have multiple projects or multiple options for a project, then you pick the one with the highest benefit cost ratio, right? <coughs> it's a way of ranking projects uh, or ranking options for uh, a, a single goal or multiple projects, you rank them and then you pick the ones that you can pay for. Um, and that's um, how this works in practice, right? It's fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, you can use this to 
look at overall environmental policy, you can look at appraisal of specific projects, you can look at uh, environmental management in general, uh, you can look at uh, the uh, Olympics, uh, you can look at a dam, you can look at uh, the uh, HS2, uh, you could look at oil projects and so on and so forth. Right? You can do this for basically everything. Uh, you can do this ex ante before the decision is made in the hope of informing uh, the decision, right? steering it in a better direction. Or you could do it after the fact, exposed, to see whether those things that you thought were great ideas in the past and therefore you decided to do it, whether knowing what you know now you still think that this is a good idea. right? And the purpose of uh, exposed evaluation is, of course, not to travel back to the past and change your decision, but the purpose is to learn from this, right? And I'll show you some examples of learning. Uh, <coughs> uh, in uh, a few minutes. Um, now, these exposed analyses tell you uh, interesting things. Uh, Bob Hahn has done a systematic evaluation of a lot of environmental regulations uh, in the United States in the early, in first half of the 1990s and finds that only half of them actually turned out to be good ideas, right? Most of them, actually, in retrospect, should never have been done. Um, David Pierce found very similar things uh, for the EU that in sort of in retrospect, a lot of the stuff uh, that came out of Brussels turned out to be not so smart, right? Um, and maybe that there is a systematic bias towards overregulation. That's of course what Nigel Farage would tell you. That uh, it's an imperialist project, uh, and therefore they're passing uh, all sorts of stuff with do with. Uh, becoming uh, even more powerful. You could also say, well, there may be uh, systematic biases in the way cost-benefit analysis is done, right? Um, or it may be that even though a project does not pass the cost-benefit test, there may be another reason <coughs> to do it. Uh, for instance, uh, maybe reasons to do with equity or things like that. Uh, <coughs> equity in cost-benefit analysis is always a difficult thing, so that is the distribution <coughs> of the costs and the benefits. Um, and uh, it's important to uh, recall that all of this is based on the Calder-Higgs criteria. Right? It's potential Pareto improvements that are after, not actual Pareto <coughs> improvements. It's the sum total of the benefits and the costs, <coughs> but not about who is bearing specific costs. Right? So even if this, the society as a whole may benefit, that, of course, does not imply that every member of society benefits, right? Uh, and um, that has to be uh, looked at separately and has to be looked at carefully. Uh, and, of course, the standard answer of an economist to this is if something is a potential Pareto improvement, then there is a system of redistribution of taxes and benefits you tax the winners and you would use the money to compensate the losers so that there can be an actual rate of improvement. Now, that is a bit of a cop-out, right? The fact that there is such a system of transfers, in theory, does not mean that there will be such a system of theory, uh, of a system of transfers in practice, right? And you need to be very, very careful there. Um, <coughs> in, in a previous live, I did some work for uh, the Irish government on the implementation of a carbon tax, where we indeed work out, yes, this is a potential Pareto improvement. And then we also worked out that one third of the carbon tax revenue should go to increase the benefits of people who are unemployed or who are uh, retired. And we worked out that one third of the carbon tax revenue would be enough to make that compensation. And we had the leader of the Labour Party, who was a member of government, who was the Tornaste, or the Deputy uh, Prime Minister uh, in English, go with her head on telly and promise that this is what they would do. 
and they didn't, right? And that was the Labour Party. Um, so there is a difference between actual and potential, and you should be very careful. Greater improvement, and you should be very careful. Uh, yeah. <coughs> and it's important to notice that this, therefore, that this cost-benefit analysis uh, is only one of the reasons to argue for a particular project. Right? It's not the reason. We don't want to live in a technocracy where some economist somewhere in an office works out that this particular project has a, uh, a benefit cost ratio greater than one and therefore we must do it and therefore we will do it, right? That is not the society I want to live in, right? Um, so what do you do if you want to do a cost benefit analysis? First you come on a start with saying why do we want to do this, right? Uh, <coughs> what is our problem? What do we want to solve? Um, then you need to uh, identify a range of solutions, a portfolio of candidate uh, projects. Uh, and of course, you also, because you're comparing it, you're saying, if we do this, we're going to improve. You need to specify improve on what, right? Um, what will happen if we don't intervene? Uh, then you need to decide on whose benefits and whose costs. Uh, I'll come back to that. Um, then, once you have decided who matters, you need to look at what would these projects do to them, right? Identify and quantify all these impacts, uh, predict their scale, somehow attach some monetary value uh, to those, uh, discount everything back to uh, today, add them all up, uh, and then you've made a million assumptions, so you need to do some sort of sensitivity analysis to see whether your conclusions change, if you make different assumptions about labor supply, or the costs uh, of uh, putting uh, tracks uh, through the Midlands, if you're building HS2 and all those things, right? And if it turns out that your results are very, very sensitive to particular assumptions, then perhaps you should wonder, are my assumptions the right ones? But you may also find that actually it doesn't matter what you assume about the cost of labor. So the fact that you're not entirely sure what you would need to pay these people doesn't matter, so why bother uh, worrying about these things, right? And then finally, once you have done all that, you need to recommend the alternative with the largest net uh, benefits. Um, and uh, the case study that George worked out is London's uh, super uh, sewer, right? So the problem uh, in London is um, that the sewers are old, uh, the basic system is Victorian, um, and all sorts of things have changed since Victorian times. Uh, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of other activities going on, and the whole system is decaying. Uh, another problem is that the mixing of rainwater and human waste, uh, and if it rains too hard, then there's overflow, and that makes sense for rainwater, right? If there's too much rain in your sewer system, then you just let it flow over the streets, right? But if sewer, uh, sewer it mixes with uh, rainwater and you let it overflow, if it rains too hard, then you have a problem, right? Uh, in your streets, it may end up in your basement, uh, it may end up, um, in uh, the Thames, and when this project was uh, discussed, uh, raw sewage ended up in the River Thames about 60 times a year, right? This is fairly frequent, right? That's two months out of 12. Um, now, why would you worry about shit in the river? Uh, it smells, it doesn't look good. Um, if you're swimming, which you shouldn't do, <laughs> you're swimming in the Thames, you may get all sorts of nasty illnesses, right? So don't swim in the Thames. Uh, that's uh, David Walliam, uh, right? Uh, you don't know. Uh, I'm old enough to recall when David Walliam was actually edgy and funny, right? But that's a long, long time ago. Um, uh, and if you have this sort of stuff in the river, then it may also kill fish, right? And the picture you see here, is a lot of that fish 
on uh, the River uh, Thames. Um, who may worry about the uh, well-being of the fish themselves, or you may be a fisher uh, and worry about uh, your prey uh, going uh, or dying, not because of you, but because of some other cause, right? Um, so there's all sorts of issues uh, with this, and the question is, how do you want to solve it? Uh, and Thames Water, that is responsible, wants to build a big tunnel under the Thames that washes everything out, actually washes it out towards uh, Surrey. Um, so what can you do? <coughs> There's a whole bunch of engineering solutions uh, to this. You can build new treatment plants. The best thing is where would you site them in London? Because London is pretty crowded. Uh, treatment plants are big and if you build them wrong they're smelly. Um, you can put upgrades uh, into existing plants. Um, which is also a lot of disturbance, uh, maybe very expensive, and it may actually be that once you are upgrading your plant, you have to uh, shut down the existing one, and that of course increases the problem, uh, at least in the short run, or you can ship everything to Surrey and let them deal uh, with the problem, build a big tunnel uh, under the Thames to uh, ship it all out. Um, you need to be kind of so so those are the solutions uh, that you can think of and the engineers that worked on this problem uh, identified 24 such uh, often i won't list them um, and of course you would need to define a baseline right what happens if you don't do anything right and that's the obvious baseline uh, at the moment so the status quo uh, is to essentially except that occasionally the raw sewage end up, ends up in the river and you would somehow get it out and you would get it out with bubbler and skimmer boats, right? Um, <coughs> who has standing? Whose benefits and whose costs? And that's a difficult one, right? Um, and typically what we do is we count all human residents. And that immediately implies that the fact that fish are killed doesn't matter as long as it doesn't matter for humans, right? We don't care about the fish per se, we only care about what the fish are to us. That is prey, right? And entertainment. And um, you may also follow uh, Theresa May's guidance and say <laughs> we don't care about non-citizen residents, we only care about citizens, right? And for London that makes a big uh, difference. Or you can follow uh, what uh, Nigel Farage would say, we don't care about people with a darker skin. Or you can follow uh, what uh, Gerard Batten is now aiming for, he's the leader of UKIP, who is at the moment railing against the Norman invaders, right? And we should not count people uh, who are somehow descendants of the friends that came over a thousand years ago, right? And we should only care about the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, my wife is Irish and she has something to say about the Anglo-Saxon invaders, right? Um, so you should be deciding who matters in this, right? <coughs> and besides the xenophobia and that sort of stuff, you should also wonder, like, how do we define this? Is this everybody within the M25? That is, it's to the benefit of London. And then, of course, the solution that you come up with is build a big tunnel and ship it all to Surrey and let them solve the problem. Or you could say, should it affect everybody who is affected by this? Right? So these are important uh, questions uh, to answer. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and the decision that they made is the five million households within London and the southeast of England, right? Because a lot of the stuff flows uh, there, or would be, uh, would be flowing there. Uh, and it's essentially um, the, the, the costs that are counted are essentially those who are clients of Thames Water and would pay for this project through their water bills, right? That is how we count the cost, or how they decided to count the cost. And these are important decisions. And you should identify all potential impacts. 
the costs will be capital expenditure and operating expenditure of all the projects uh, that are there, other costs, and those are relatively easy uh, to express uh, in money terms, right? Uh, but there's also non-market costs, like the noise and the disruption during the uh, construction. You can think of uh, the, the energy that is used and the dust that is generated and so on and so forth. <coughs> Uh, that should also somehow be uh, included. Uh, there is uh, the benefit side as well. Some of them are relatively uh, straightforward to uh, put a, a pound value on. And that is, I mean, at the moment we solve it by essentially scooping the shit out of the river. And if you don't put it there in the first place, you don't need to do that anymore. Right? So you also see a reduction <coughs> in the cost of operation, uh, and that is relatively easy. Uh, but you also need to take into account uh, the river will look better, the river will smell better, uh, fewer people will uh, fall ill, uh, fewer fish will be killed, and somehow that needs to be taken into consideration as well. Right? So you need to do all those things. <coughs> um, and if you do such a, a project, and if you do such an evaluation, then you immediately run into the issue that there's a whole lot of things that you, you know it's there, but you can't quite put your finger on it or you can't put numbers on it or perhaps you can't put numbers on it because the mayor has given you 12 months to do this project evaluation and there's only so much you can do within that limited time or you may have be time constrained uh, maybe time constraint, you may be budget constraint, you may be constraint in uh, the amount of people that work for you <coughs> And uh, things that are ignored by this particular project evaluation are the ecological impact other than the uh, fish kills, cultural heritage, forget it, we're not going to look at those. Um, air quality was not considered, odor was not considered, noise was not considered, vibration was not considered. Uh, <coughs> problem with vibration is that you damage old buildings um, and <coughs> major construction work uh, often cause damage to buildings nearby, to roads nearby. Uh, and that's a real cost, but uh, in this case, omitted, right? I mean, you can immediately say, well, this project was there for, or this evaluation was there for. <coughs> uh, <coughs> then you need to uh, quantify uh, everything, right? And it's difficult always. In this case, it's particularly difficult, right? Because there are, it's a four-dimensional evaluation. And I talked about that. Uh, there's 24 projects. And then you not build a new sewer or a new treatment plant for tomorrow. These things have an expected lifetime of 50 years. So you not only need to predict the number of uh, fish that are killed, for 24 different interve interventions, but also over a 50 year period. So you need to predict the population of fish in the year 2040. Right? Um, so this, this is, this is uh, you need to project wages in 40 years time, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is a hard problem, right? Um, and that may introduce all sorts of uh, biases, all sorts of issues. Some of them are systematic. I talked a little bit about learning uh, before. <coughs> uh, this is from uh, the Treasury. Um, and they say that whenever somebody comes with a proposal to do something and then their costs, then depending on the proposal, you need to correct for optimism bias. Whenever an engineer tells you I can do it for a hundred thousand pounds, you really need to take into account that they're building a standard house, but really what they mean is they can do it for a hundred and twenty-four thousand pounds, right? That is what they mean by a hundred. They mean a hundred and twenty-four. Uh, <coughs> and that is uh, what you see here, and depending on the uh, project type, that optimism bias can be 4% uh, if you're talking about standard buildings, but if you're talking about, say, HS2, something that has never been done before, uh, then really if they say you can do it for 1 billion, really what they mean to say is, yeah, it's going to cost you 3 billion, right? 
um, and you need to take that sort of stuff into account and fortunately we have now so much experience with these things that we know what these numbers mean when they say it. Of course they're playing games, right? Because they know that we're going to correct. So they are taking that uh, into account, right? So these numbers uh, increase all the time. <coughs> uh, then you need to put everything uh, on a common metric, monetize, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the next three weeks. Um, some things are traded on markets, other things are not traded on markets, and you need somehow uh, to, need to put a price on this. Uh, and this is uh, the numbers that are used. And as I said, I'm going to talk about this uh, at length, right? So essentially, what they say is if this is getting killed, then this is going to cost £1.51 per event but that is not per event that is actually per event per person uh, and the same is true uh, for the health risk right? it's not that, that is worth 38p uh, that is per person per day right? uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about where these numbers come from uh, at length next week in regards to that um, <coughs> then you need to discount the whole lot to today right uh, Cost and benefits occur at different uh, times of the year, so you need to bring it uh, to uh, today. Um, and the discount rate is terribly important. I don't think I need to repeat uh, that. So if we invest £100 today, what is it worth? Well, if you get an interest rate of 2.1%, then in 100 years' time, uh, that £100 has become £799, uh, right? But if you earn an interest rate of 10%, then that hundred pounds is worth uh, 1.4 million in a hundred years time right so that is interest rates discounting works the same but in the opposite direction so if the discount rate is 10 percent then one point benefit of 1.4 million in a hundred years time is worth a hundred pounds today right So discounting is terribly, terribly important. Uh, I'm going to talk at length about discounting in the climate class next term, right? Um, and I'm going to do a bit more than just this table. Um, <laughs> um, and then you need to uh, add it uh, all up. And it turned out that building the big tunnel and dump everything on Surrey uh, is the uh, best. Uh, the best thing and it would have a benefit of three to five billion uh, pounds um, that's a net benefit so this seems to be a good idea right if you can invest a bit of money uh, or if you can invest a lot of money and in the end uh, come out four billion richer then uh, that seems to be uh, a good idea right <coughs> and i talked about uh, the difficulties of predicting uh, the future um, risk aversion and everything um, comes into play. And this, by, by now you have sort of got a feeling that this involves a lot of steps and it involves a lot of decisions, some of which may be very questionable. Right? We include certain things, we exclude other things, we pick a discount rate and so on and so forth. Um, and that means that all sorts of things uh, can go uh, wrong, right? Uh, measurement errors, omission errors, valuation errors, forecasting errors, uh, all those things I talked about. And then there's of course also strategic errors, uh, economists for hire. So if you're doing a project evaluation uh, of Brexit and you want it to be a good idea, what do you do? You hire Patrick Minford because he will tell you that if we Brexit and the harder the Brexit, the richer we will be. What does, that mean? does that mean that Patrick Minford is dishonest? He disagrees with basically all other economists? No, I don't think it's a matter of dishonesty. I think he really believes this. If not so much that you can hire certain consultants, or in this case, uh, certain academics, who will give you the answer that you want? No, from 
previous work, you know somebody's ideological color, you know somebody's opinions. So if you as a politician want a certain outcome, if you want a certain outcome of a study, a certain recommendation to come from a certain study, you know who, who to ask, you know which consultant to hire, or which academic to hire, to see that is the result we're going to get. Right? So it's not so much that people change their conclusions depending on who pays them, it's more that smart politicians and smart senior civil servants know who to hire to get a desired result. Right? Um, <clears throat> and often what we actually see in when you're doing this sort of work for the government, that the decision actually has already been made. And it's not so much that we have um, evidence-based policy that you do the study and then you decide evidence-based policy, but rather it's policy-based evidence that the decision has been made, has not been announced in public yet, and then civil servants and their consultants are going to scramble to find the justification for that decision that has already been made. Right? We uh, see a lot of that. Um, but let's assume uh, that in a slightly uh, more honest world, uh, then you make uh, a uh, recommendation, and typically that would be uh, the project with the highest net present uh, value. <coughs> I emphasize again that this should inform the decision rather than determine uh, the decision. So what happened uh, in this case? Well, originally, the Office for Water, that's a regulator, rejected uh, the original proposal uh, because it would increase the average household bill for water services by 85 pounds a year, and they deemed that unacceptable. Um, so they redid the cost-benefit analysis four years later. Um, and the, one of the main objections was that they sort of had forgotten about Surrey. Um, and they included Surrey in the, in the next round. Um, still found positive uh, net present value. And by now, they are building uh, the thing. Um, that is, they're building the super sewer. They're digging this enormous tunnel under the Thames to take sewage from North London and dump it into Surrey or actually in the treatment plant uh, in Surrey, not just uh, in the hills of Surrey. Um, and if you want to know more about this project, uh, that is uh, where you can find it. Um, so cost-benefit analysis uh, is a way of helping people decide, helping uh, decide on pro uh, complicated uh, pro projects. Uh, the good thing is that it's accountability, right? You can actually see what went in. Uh, it's transparent to those who know how to read uh, these numbers. Uh, and hopefully it's done consistently. That is, across different pro projects, a similar methodology is used, right? <coughs> um, and uh, the good thing is that it sort of creates at least potential operator improvements. So it enlarges the pie. If the pie is larger, then you can also solve the uh, equity problems that may come along. Um, and at the very least, it can start uh, discussions about should we do this, yes or no. Um, the disadvantages is that there's all sorts of things uh, can go wrong. It's a very technocratic approach uh, to decision making. Um, some of the things are hard to include, as we mentioned here again. Uh, the uncertainties may be too large to say anything useful. Again, we're going to talk about it uh, next term in the context of climate um, and there may be people who are smart enough uh, to manipulate the results and there's definitely people dumb enough to make very silly mistakes uh, in the evaluation of these things. That's all I wanted to say.